And so we have these uh, fourfold and sevenfold and twelvefold sorts of activities. So this is like, this is why biodynamics is concerned about having a planting calendar and especially for breeding that you want to avail yourself of the potentials for planting things at different times or breeding them at certain times so that you take advantage of maximizing the characteristics you're looking for in plants and animals. Now, with the horn manure preparation, then you fill cow horns up with manure and you bury them over the winter. Now, you may fill them up on the autumnal equinox, but it works, let me tell you, to fill them up a week, two or three weeks later, or even a week or so earlier. And you dig them up after the spring equinox, and you may wait. Easter doesn't occur at the equinox, the vernal equinox. It occurs afterwards. It's the first full moon after the spring equinox. And that's important because the tone and life is actually imparted to the earth with the full moon. So those forces that are flowing into, and we're always talking about force with biodynamics. We didn't put substances on that corn to get it to grow so vigorously. We imparted forces to it by using these biodynamic preparations. And so you wouldn't dig up your horn manure, ideally, until after the first full moon, in other words, after Easter. Chain slots. This one here is the horn silica. It's a little bit different preparation. You take and pound up. I've got a, a pipe. This is galvanized pipe that I took a steel plate this thick and welded it on the bottom. And I've got another smaller pipe that I took a big bolt and I welded it in and I ground it off smooth. And that creates a mortar and pestle that when you wham the inner pipe down on quartz that's inside, it will break it up into a sort of grainy sand. And you pour it out and you will then screen it and you take a couple sheets of glass, wear some earplugs. Because it's very, very loud noise at first, but you grind this until it's just a whisper and you will get colloidal fineness in those uh, silica particles. And you moisten that and fill the horns with it and you bury it from the spring equinox through the summer to the autumnal equinox. And this, then, is when the warmth and light is coming through the earth into the atmosphere. You know, the light bounces off the soil into the atmosphere. That's how we see it. So, it's actually the light of the summer is occurring in the atmosphere, and definitely the warmth as well. If you've ever walked on asphalt pav pavement in bare feet in the height of the summer in Florida, well then, you've experienced warmth. And it's coming from the soil upward. Okay. What happens in the moon? And the horn clay. Clay is very interesting because it's colloidal. And the particle size is down around uh, minus 10 to the 8th or 9th. So it's very fine material. And the sort of little, little platelets of clay provide a maximum surface area for this boundary phenomena of life to arise. So clay is a very important uh, component of the soil for your ion exchange. It provides all those surfaces and membranes, and so it's a microbial habitat there. And it provides the silica basis for capillary action to occur. Now, we've got in biodynamics several herbal preparations, and these are made oftentimes 
uh, by taking the essential character of the plant, such as its flowers, and encasing that in an animal sheath. The horn is an animal sheath, and it's got a certain function in the physiology of the cow. The bladder is also an animal sheath, but it has almost the opposite effect to the horn. And so you see in cattle on the equator that have evolved there, like your Kenyan cattle, they have absolutely enormous, very, very impressive horns. But in your Norwegian breeds, which are near the poles, then you see uh, no horns at all. And so your pole breeds are actually dealing with this etheric flow that's flowing into the earth from around its equator and spiraling out its poles and going on towards the sun. You see that uh, flow of warmth and light ether that is expressed by the cows having those horns near the equator that the blood flow is all internal to the horn and the horn is a cone that focuses on the inside of the, of the structure. It focuses on that blood flow within the horn. But with your cervidacea, your elk and moose and reindeer and of course your more ordinary deer, let me tell you, Ken Kenyan deer only have barely some little prongs. Whereas your moose and reindeer and whatnot with these enormous antlers are living near the poles because those are structures that are there to vent the ether and instead of the female having the densest horns as in, with, as in cattle then the males are the ones with the antlers and the blood flow that goes into the horn goes into the velvet around the horn as the horn's growing and then when that sloughs off and the horn stops growing then it's an annual cycle that they shed those horns so it lets you know something about what's happening with the warmth and light in the summer that's spiraling out of the poles and in the winter recedes back into the earth. So you, those are structures that are valves for the outflow of ether. What's 502? Now, your yarrow plant has an interesting characteristic. It's very strongly related to sulfur so it's dealing with uh, the boundary phenomena. This leaf has more boundary for its surface area than practically any other plant you'll ever see. Uh, there are some algal plants, and I think if you looked at Azola, for instance, you might see something very similar. But this one here is an absolute quintessential sulfur gesture plant, and it's associated with urine and the bladder. So you use the bladder of the male deer to stuff these yarrow flowers in and hang it in the summer sun and then you bury it over the winter in the earth. And that becomes the basis for what's called BD502. And it's a great sulfur activator. Uh, then you have got the chamomile preparation. This one has a sulfur gesture, but it's really much more related to calcium and to digestion. So you can imagine how chamomile tea settles the digestion. Whereas yarrow tea, when you've got the flu, it'll really help you. You cycle a lot of fluids through and you'll sweat and you'll, you excrete a lot. So this one is working with the planet associated with digestion, which is the planet Mercury. And it's working really with with calcium more than it's working with sulfur. Next slide. Then you've got the stinging nettle, which is actually what you use is the leaf and stem. And instead of the flowers, which are giving off energy, you're putting that part of the plant that gathers in and builds up energy. And so you put the leaf and stem in, and this one here has got such a rich mineral picture, the whole spectrum, from lime to silica, that it represents the sun. And it works like the human blood. And it's the best remedy for anemia or blood loss. It's an absolute herbal uh, miracle plant. 
And interestingly enough, it has been tested as having the highest levels of fluoride. Fluoride is one element in the periodic table that can solubilize silica like almost instantaneously. It's really good for solubilizing silica. And probably our silica solubilizing uh, bacteria such as the archaea that were the original rock eaters on the planet, uh, probably they use fluorine to digest rocks, but they only use a little bit. Uh, next slide. Now we're talking about the plant that best represents the moon, and this would be uh, commonly the oak bark preparation. In Australia, we use a different tree and use the bark of that instead. But uh, this preparation here really works with the calcium. Now, it works with the silica too. But what you're doing with this preparation is you're taking the outer bark, which has been exposed and it's leached most of its nitrogen. And so it's very nitrogen poor, but it's very carbon rich and very mineral rich. And you grind that up and you put it in the cavity inside a cow's skull, or you could use another uh, farm animal, and you put it in a place where water is trickling over the winter. This will be where nitrification is leaching nitrates and other elements, boron, silicon, and calcium primarily. It's leaching them out of the soil, and this one here catches them and it generates in that oak bark the right sorts of microbial activities to reduce nitrates and other loose nutrients. So it really brings a fertility response that you want to have happen in your soil that will keep the loose nutrients from occurring. This plant here for the uh, dandelion preparation, dandelion is a plant that just goes straight to the chase. It doesn't, doesn't have to like rise up with a big stalk in order to purify its substance in order to reach the quintessential nature of the plant that you see in the blossoming process. It blossoms right down the leaf whorl. If you mow it off, it'll blossom lower. It's just getting the blossoms into the light. And uh, it, it removes obstructions. It really makes fruits fill out nice and fat and shiny with good solid, root, uh, good solid cell structure. And it's a boron collector and a silica plant that can get potassium moving in the plant. So this one here really works in the development of fruits on the silica and potassium side. And it's the one that makes it possible for the amino acid nitrogen that's generated in the soil by the chamomile preparation and the digestion that goes with it. And so it works in tandem, and we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, it works in tandem with your uh, 503. Then you've got a plant here that really works with phosphorus and all the energy processes in plants. This one here will really make things bloom. If you used it by itself, you would get blossoming without fruit formation and so forth. So you use this one to get that flowering process going, but you also want to have, uh, you want to have fruiting follow that. So you want to see with this one, where the male and the stream male, female streams divide in the flowering process and reunite to generate a new generation of plants. We have this belief that the plants 